welcome everyone to the Dr. Robert Meyerberg Endowed Lecture in Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, this was established in 2011 for a fundraising campaign to support an annual lecture in the Division of Cardiology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Uh, former fellows and several grateful patients uh, donated to the endowed fund, uh, many of whom are with us today. Um, and really to honor the tremendous contributions that Dr. Meyerberg uh, has made in clinical medicine, uh, education, and research. And we're really delighted that he continues to be a force in all of these uh, endeavors uh, still today. Um, and uh, the uh, funds that were raised really allows us uh, to bring you the lecture uh, that we have today. Uh, Dr. Deepak Bhatt uh, will be introduced in a moment. Uh, and just to note, this is actually our sixth annual Meyerberg Lecture, and uh, we're really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Bott uh, and everyone else who's joined us, and now pass it on for his introduction. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really honored to welcome Dr. Deepak Bott to our annual Robert J. Meyerberg Endowed Lecture in Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, Dr. Bott is a luminary in the field of cardiology research, focusing on coronary artery disease, preventive cardiology, and advanced techniques in cardiovascular intervention. Dr. Bott is the executive director of interventional cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and a senior investigator of the Timmy Group. Welcome, Dr. Bott. Great, well, thank you for having me. Uh, just to confirm, are you able to hear me well? Yes. Okay, terrific. Good. Well, let me get started, first of all, by saying what a pleasure it is to be here, especially as a Marburg lecturer, really quite an honor, and uh, I'm, I'm most appreciative of that. So I'm going to speak a bit about residual cardiovascular risk with a focus on the reduce it trial and its implications, but start off with uh, putting it in historical context. My disclosures are here, but relevant to this talk is research funding from Amrin. Uh, that is paid to Brigham and Women's Hospital for my role as the Reduce It Study Chair. And during the course of this presentation, I may discuss off-label and or investigational uses of drugs, including icosapentethyl, which was the drug studied in the Reduce It trial. So before getting started or too specific about residual risk reduction, let me start with this concept of prevention. Now, of course, you're all familiar with secondary or tertiary prevention, that is treating patients with obvious established cardiovascular disease and primary prevention, treating risk factors. Those are really important. But of course, there's also primordial prevention that doesn't get as much attention, uh, but is the attempt to prevent the development of risk factors in the first place. And that really is largely through lifestyle modification at a personal and societal level, uh, things such as making sure we're in smoke-free environments that uh, patients and people are eating healthy diets, uh, largely plant-based diets, uh, maintaining weight or if overweight, losing weight, and encouraging physical activity and daily exercise and trying to reduce environmental pollution. These are all different ways that one can promote cardiovascular health. In fact, even promoting fetal and infant health can have uh, dividends in terms of reducing subsequent cardiovascular disease. And um, through the course of this talk, I'm not going to be speaking much about uh, this sort of lifestyle modification, but uh, that doesn't mean that it isn't the foundation of everything we do in cardiovascular prevention, it is. But in terms of typical sorts of risk factors that we think about in prevention, LDL cholesterol has emerged at the top of that list. At this point, it is a thoroughly validated uh, surrogate marker of risk, that is, Patients with elevated LDL cholesterol are at increased risk, and targeting that biomarker elevation with medications does reduce the associated risk. And again, lifestyle is an important part of managing cholesterol, but beyond diet and exercise, exactly when to start lipid-lowering therapy or LDL cholesterol-lowering therapy depends. And shown here in this figure from Mike Shapiro, uh, and I, in a uh, recent uh, JAK editorial, we put together this concept of area under the curve. Now, everybody knows about pack years, for example, of smoking. The more pack years, the worse. But this is sort of the same thing. It's LDL cholesterol years. That is, the higher the LDL cholesterol for the longer duration of time, the higher the cardiovascular risk will be. 
And therefore, it's important to start LDL therapy early, in particular when people have very high LDL cholesterol, such as familial hypercholesterolemia. But even when they have more modest degrees of hypercholesterolemia, starting therapy earlier, uh, if it can be done safely, is probably the way the field is going. Now that's LDL cholesterol. What about triglycerides? Are they a causal risk factor? This has been a long-standing debate, uh, whether they are causal risk factors or innocent bystanders or guilty bystanders. And in this nice editorial from Peter Libby, he's put forth that indeed triglycerides are causal risk factors. That's what the weight of the evidence supports. Uh, though to be specific, it's not triglycerides, but rather triglyceride-rich lipoproteins that are the actual atherosclerotic uh, risk factor. So um, triglycerides are back on the map and measuring them and keeping track of them is an important thing to do. What evidence supports this? Well, these are some Mendelian randomization data. If you're familiar with this uh, type of research, uh, looking at nature's randomizations, that is different people born with different genotypes and what the associations are with cardiovascular risk. And in this particular Mendelian randomization, what we found was that uh, mutations that are associated with lower LDL cholesterol are associated with lower degrees of cardiovascular risk and same with triglycerides, both independent risk factors and apparently modifiable. A key difference though, that I think is not commonly appreciated is the relationship with risk. That is the implication of this Mendelian randomization study is that if one pharmacologically lowers LDL, and again, the Mendelian randomization is genes, it has nothing to do with drugs, but the implication is that one pharmacologically lowers LDL by a bit, it lowers cardiovascular risk. The story with triglycerides though is different. Yes, lowering triglycerides should also lower cardiovascular risk. You have to lower triglycerides by a lot to get the same sort of effect of lowering LDL by a lesser amount. So, um, if any of this really holds true in terms of implications for pharmacotherapy, it would mean that for a triglyceride-lowering drug to work uh, beyond just LDL-dependent pathways, it would have to be a very large reduction in triglycerides. And uh, fortunately, uh, there are such drugs. Um, there are lots of promising therapies, as a matter of fact, for hypertriglyceridemia. There are older therapies like high-dose omega-3 fatty acids that lower triglycerides by a bit, um, but then there are newer therapies as well that lower triglycerides by an enormous amount, uh, such as approaches that target RNA. Uh, these molecular approaches lower triglycerides by 50, 80, 90, over 100%. So very potent triglyceride reduction. And assuming that there's no off-target toxicity from these approaches that emerges in larger scale human testing, uh, then potentially we will be able to see if there's a novel therapeutic pathway that is lowering triglycerides by an enormous amount. And really it's lowering the triglyceride rich lipoprotein by an enormous amount. If these trials are negative, then that tells us that this pathway of lowering triglycerides you know, really isn't a useful one. My guess is it will be useful, again, assuming no off-target toxicities emerge. Let me shift now to omega-3 fatty acids, and that'll be the focus of the rest of this presentation. They lower triglycerides when used at high doses, as I alluded to, but they also appear to have anti-inflammatory effects. This is a pilot study from back when I was at Cleveland Clinic where we looked at an omega-3 fatty acid and effects on inflammatory markers, and it did appear uh, that there was an effect on C-reactive protein levels here small study, a bunch of limitations to it. And you know, that's been the issue with omega-3 fatty acid. There's a lot of research supporting health benefits, but usually they're small studies, unblinded, oftentimes not really that rigorous from a methodological perspective. So you know, that's kind of hampered uh, the field in terms of our basic science understanding and mechanistic understanding. But the clinical trial literature has uh, really been uh, quite rich, at least in terms of the uh, trials, if not the results. And shown here is a meta-analysis of mostly low-dose mixtures of omega-3 fatty acids. There are, of course, all sorts of different omega-3 fatty acids. And these trials examine mixtures, mixtures of things like DHA and EPA, for example, uh, usually at low dose, somewhere more than low dose. But uh, the message is consistent. Overall, a rate ratio of 0.97. Uh, that means uh, really no difference at all versus the respective control arms. No clear evidence of cardiovascular harm, 
but no compelling evidence, certainly no statistically significant evidence of benefit. So that's the story for mixtures of omega-3 fatty acids. Again, in this meta-analysis, it was largely low dose, but more recently, high dose mixtures of omega-3 fatty acids have been studied in the STRENT trial. And this trial studied a prescription omega-3 fatty acid, a mixture of DHA and EPA and some other things, uh, maybe not the best uh, drug actually subject to oxidation, but nevertheless uh, studied in a well-designed trial uh, that found absolutely no benefit of the omega-3 fatty acid preparation versus placebo. In fact, the Data Safety Monitoring Board stopped the trial early for futility and the final analysis confirmed that no evidence of benefit. Uh, so no benefit seen in this trial, which used four grams per day. So I'll say a high dose, but still a mixture of omega-3 fatty acids. So really confirming what was seen at lower dose with the mixtures with a higher dose. And also the AMAMI trials come out recently. Uh, this also used a mixture of EPA and DHA, different omega-3 fatty acids, but this is a dietary supplement that was studied here. In strength, it was a prescription medicine, one that was never actually um, uh, uh, put out there by the company. Uh, and in fact, the company's terminated the whole program, but, but a prescription medicine, uh, whereas here we're talking in AMAMI about a dietary supplement and an intermediate dose, 1.8 grams a day of a mixture of omega-3, but same story, no significant difference uh, versus the control arm. Uh, so uh, the older trials of mixtures of omega-3 fatty acids and two newer ones at intermediate and high dose, same consistent story, negative trials. What's been going on though, and I don't know that everyone in medicine is completely aware of it, is a revolution in omega-3 fatty acid research. And uh, there's a lot of complexity to this biology probably for the sake of time, I, I can't really go through this in too much detail, but I'll try to go through it quickly. So there are lots of different omega-3 fatty acids. I'm talking about omega-3 fatty acids, not omega-6 fatty acids, that's a totally different topic, but omega-3 fatty acids. Many people, certainly the lay public, believe them to be beneficial for health. And foods that contain them certainly seem to be beneficial for uh, cardiovascular health. Here at the top, we see alpha-linolenic acid or ALA, an omega-3 fatty acid uh, that is derived from sources such as chia seeds and flax seeds and walnuts and not listed on the slide. Some uh, green uh, leafy vegetables also have some degree of ALA, not really a lot, uh, but if um, one is vegetarian or vegan, these are natural uh, uh, sources of getting omega-3 fatty acid, ALA. Uh, that then goes through a number of different enzymatic steps and is converted to EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid which will be the focus of the majority of the remainder of this talk. The natural source of EPA is marine oily fish. And then there's several other enzymatic steps. Here's docosapentaenoic acid. There's some companies trying to uh, make that into a pharmaceutical. A few more enzymatic steps. And then in the peroxisome after beta oxidation, uh, there is the uh, production of DHA or docosahexaenoic acid. Also, this can be obtained from marine oily fish for people that eat fish and seafood. So uh, those are natural sources of those particular omega-3 fatty acids. However, they're all quite different. If you look at the downstream products of EPA and DHA, for example, uh, they're different. Uh, and EPA, for example, produces things like SPM, specialized pro-resolving mediators that are believed to be very potent anti-inflammatory drugs, not like uh, the way that IL-1 or IL-6 antagonists are really much more fundamental uh, and downstream than that. So um, th these are properties of omega-3 fatty acids that might explain potential cardiovascular or other benefits. Uh, DHA also has a number of uh, downstream uh, mediators, some of which are anti-inflammatory as well. Now, the way I've shown this, and, and probably this slide will be out of date uh, soon because there's lots of different scientists working on figuring out these different steps. Uh, there are some that believe there's retroconversion that occurs from DHA backwards, uh, but that is a bit controversial. That's why I didn't actually put that in this figure. Uh, but uh, the point being, there's a lot of complexity here. And um, you know, not all omega-3 fatty acids are created equal. Now, the difference is here between say EPA in the middle or DHA, you know, it's just a couple of different uh, carbon double bonds and, and length of the carbon chain, but that makes a big difference in biology. You know, to say that EPA and DHA, well, they're all omega-3 fatty acids, they're all pretty much the same, would be saying that 
estrogen and testosterone are the same. And of course, they're pretty similar, chemically speaking, but they're very different in their biological effects. And I think we should look at omega-3 fatty acids in the same way. Sure, there's uh, lots of uh, biochemical similarities if you're staring at this slide from a distance, but uh, the closer you get, uh, these uh, subtle differences in, in uh, chain length, for example, have lots of different downstream biological effects. So bottom line, it's not really scientifically appropriate to just lump all the omega-3 fatty acids together. Now I'm going to speak about EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid that is derived from nature, uh, largely uh, marine sources, and the prescription medication known as eicosapentethyl or IPE, which is a highly purified ethyl ester of EPA. It's a prescription medication made, manufactured, shipped, packaged in ways that prevent oxidation because if an omega-3 fatty acid gets oxidized, it likely takes away any potential biological human benefit that it might have otherwise had. So uh, the drug matters, but all those other aspects matter too. It's the difference between prescription drugs and dietary supplements. So all those steps actually matter and are regulated uh, by the FDA and other uh, health authorities around the world. So at any rate, uh, EPA uh, and icosapentethyl are linked in that way, but they're not exactly uh, synonymous. So. Uh, the prescription medicine icosapentethyl is consumed and at an intestinal level via lipase is converted to EPA and the ethyl group. And then that EPA is reesterified and phospholipids and triglycerides and packaged for transport and colomicrons. So uh, that's how the icosapentethyl gets in there and does its job as EPA, which then has many downstream biological effects. This compound, icosapentethyl, this prescription medication, was first studied in the JELUS trial as published in the Lancet in 2007. And this is a really uh, important and well done trial, though with some limitations that kept it from actually influencing global practice. But, but, but nonetheless, especially with the benefit of the retrospectroscope, uh, a very important study. 18,000 Japanese patients who were randomized to icosapentethyl prescription medication or to control. So this is a randomized but open-label trial, a probe design, meaning open-label, no placebo, and blinded endpoint adjudication. So very rigorous other than the lack of placebo. And uh, the patients were all Japanese. Uh, they were randomized to 1.8 grams a day of icosapentethyl uh, versus none. Again, there was no placebo here. And the overall trial was positive, a 19% relative risk reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events from ACE. Uh, this was a rather low risk population that was studied, 80% primary prevention, 69% women. The uh, triglycerides in over half the patients were normal. Uh, so this wasn't a triglyceride lowering trial per se. The reduction in triglycerides was uh, rather trivial, only about 5% or so. But uh, nonetheless, uh, this dose of 1.8 grams per day of icosapentethyl significantly reduced major adverse cardiovascular events with benefits that were consistent in the secondary prevention and primary prevention subgroups from this large trial. But these are rather low event rates. This is a low risk population. In a bit, I'll speak about the reducer trial, which is a much higher risk population, but the same drug was studied or the same active ingredient uh, was studied, icosapentethyl. Now this study, I, I hesitate a little bit, uh, but for the sake of completeness, I'm showing it. This is also a randomized open label Japanese trial. Jealous was 18,000 patients. This is 200 patients. These are all post PCI patients who were randomized to icosapentethyl or not. Again, open label, everybody got a statin and they were followed for a year. So, you know, it's an underpowered study. The duration's too short. But nevertheless, there was a significant reduction in MACE, and interestingly, even a significant re reduction in cardiovascular death. Again, obviously the trial is, uh, is underpowered for MACE, it's way underpowered for CV death. It's interesting as a footnote, uh, but you know, wouldn't change practice on it, uh, but uh, results that are positive in a randomized trial. Here's the CHERRY trial, again, a Japanese trial of icosapentethyl, 1.8 grams a day, 200 post-PCI patients. Everybody's getting four milligrams a day of a good statin and then is randomized to 1.8 grams a day of icosapentethyl or to not get that. So again, it's open label, but randomized. 
patients are assessed by intravascular ultrasound or IBIS in an invasive way of looking at plaque, and they're followed for six to eight months, which is way too short for an IBIS study. I don't know what they were thinking. IBIS studies were typically, you know, at least a year, 18 months, two years. But at any rate, that's how they designed it. And the trial was extremely positive, uh, showing a significant benefit in that short period of time with respect to plaque progression rates being significantly lower with icosapentethyl plus statin versus statin alone. So a significant benefit on this surrogate imaging endpoint. Essentially, what they concluded was plaque regression with icosapentethyl. That was Japanese patients. This is more recent data in the Western world, actually in the US, the Evaporate trial. And this used non-invasive CT angiography to basically do what Cherry did uh, to study icosapentethyl, albeit here four grams per day uh, and versus a placebo in a blinded trial. So a bit more rigorous and non-invasive. And what was found in the interim nine month analysis of this imaging study was a significant reduction in a variety of different measures of plaque volume and composition, uh, albeit not the pre-specified primary endpoint in that interim analysis. And here's the final evaporate analysis where that primary uh, endpoint of low attenuation plaque was significantly different uh, between icosapentethyl and placebo and really a variety of different measures of plaque volume composition favorably influenced by icosapentethyl versus placebo. So conceptually replicating what was seen in Cherry, uh, albeit in US patients. How does Evaporate compare with other trials of non-invasive CT angiography? Well, in general, uh, those trials have shown progression of plaque uh, in the control arms, uh, but in terms of uh, potential regression of plaque, uh, that was really uh, only seen in Evaporate among the trials listed here. And in the editorial uh, to the Evaporate paper, uh, the editorialists uh, raised the question, can EPA evaporate plaques? Uh, and indeed the data do support that at least in some patients that does appear to be happening. Now, before I go on to speak about icosapentethyl and the studies in the West, um, it's important to make sure we're all on the same page with our terminology. So I'm going to be talking more about icosapentethyl, a prescription medication. And uh, it's very important to distinguish that from dietary supplements, fish oil supplements, sometimes called over-the-counter supplements. So that's a misnomer. They're not strictly speaking supposed to be called over-the-counter. They're dietary supplements. What that means is the FDA regulates them as the FDA regulates food. There's some degree of oversight. You wanna make sure people you know, aren't dying or getting poisoned. Uh, but they're not regulated in the way that a prescription drug is regulated by the FDA, where not only is safety ascertained, but efficacy must be demonstrated. That is for a dietary supplement, you can say whatever you want to about efficacy, make any bold, unfounded claim. For prescription medicine, you can't say a drug's reducing heart attack unless a study actually has shown that. The FDA has vetted the study and said it can go in the labeling. So it's a much, much more rigorous uh, process. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, many patients are on dietary supplements, probably a third of your patients are on omega-3 fatty acid supplements if you ask them and they tell you the truth. Um, but there are differences between these uh, that are important. Uh, you know, prescription medicines obviously require prescription. Branded prescription medicines tend to be expensive. Dietary supplements tend to be expensive. They're not cheap. Patients uh, pay for them out of pocket, but, uh, well, but they aren't cheap. But what about the uh, composition? Well, here is work from Preston Mason in Boston looking at the leading dietary supplement. And he couldn't put the name here because he was afraid he might get sued. Uh, and the leading uh, omega-3 prescription uh, uh, fatty acid. It's actually icosapentethyl, but he didn't want to put that there either because he didn't want to be brand specific, but that's what the two things are. And uh, putting aside the science and just looking at it, they look different. Why do they look different? Well, on the left with the dietary supplement is oxidation in action. That's what happens when fatty acids are oxidized. They get this sort of whitish appearance. Uh, that's why uh, fish smells bad when it goes bad. That's why dietary supplements have a fishy odor. That's why patients often complain about a fishy burp if they take a lot of omega-3 fatty acid supplements. Uh, but with prescription icosapentethyl, as you can see, it's clear. Uh, it's also liquid. Um, that's a, a picture being worth a thousand words, but, but what about the science? Well, Dr. Mason also did some aspect on these two samples, 
And this is what he found for the supplement, the, the icosapentethyl is over 96% pure EPA, but what did he find for the supplement? Well, yeah, there's some EPA in there. That's probably a good thing. There's some DHA in there that might be good or bad, who knows. Uh, but what's really there is a bunch of saturated and other fats, all subject to oxidation, such that even if that EPA in there was wanting to do some good and provide some cardiovascular benefit, uh, these other substances, oxidation, which even the EPA is subject to, could undo any potential benefit that might otherwise be expected. So bottom line, dietary supplement, patients love them. I actively try to de-prescribe them. So let's focus now on EPA. I don't have the time to go through all the potential benefits of EPA, but there is a lot of science there showing benefits on endothelial function, through enhanced nitric oxide bioavailability, favorable alterations in the EPA to arachidonic acid ratio, uh, increases in IL-10, that's a good thing, decreases in a variety of different inflammatory markers, plaque stabilization, antiplatelet effects. Uh, there's just uh, you know, effects on uh, decreasing oxidation of LDL and diminishing cholesterol crystalline domain formation. There's a lot of different things. I mean, EPA is really pleiotropic in the truest sense of the word. But I'll show you one set of experiments. These are cell membrane preparations. This is crystallography. So, you know, it's, it's basic science, but I think it's important, well done by Dr. Mason in his lab. And what it shows is that EPA, icosapentaenoic acid, stabilizes the phospholipid bilayer. That is, these blue squiggly EPA lines stabilize the cell membrane. Whereas DHA, uh, the curly Q green here, actually destabilizes the phospholipid bilayer. And this might explain some of the biological differences between EPA, which has been conclusively shown to reduce cardiovascular risk, at least when given in the form of icosapentethyl, and DHA, where the jury's still out, whether it is beneficial, harmful, or neutral for cardiovascular endpoints. Uh, having said that, I, it's not that I think DHA is evil, uh, there are some lines of evidence to suggest it might be useful for the developing uh, uh, brain or retina in the infant. In fact, in the U.S., DHA is supposed to be an infant formula for that believed uh, uh, purpose, that it's useful in those situations. I'm not sure how strong the science really is there, but it is a strong belief uh, among nutritional chemists that DHA should be an infant formula. So maybe it's good for the developing brain and eye, but for the adult with cardiovascular disease or at risk for it, EPA is where the action is, at least right now. And icosapentethyl outside of Japan has been studied extensively in the West in a series of trials called MARINE. Uh, this was a trial of patients with triglycerides greater than 500, where they were randomized to icosapentethyl four grams a day or placebo. And what was found was a significant reduction in triglycerides. And that led to FDA approval of icosapentethyl. And since that time, it's been used in millions of patients in the US with a good safety profile. Next came anchor, triglycerides between 200 and 500 and other positive studies showing triglyceride reduction, significant triglyceride reduction on top of statins, et cetera. A great results in terms of that biomarker, but the FDA said, so what? Show us that it reduces cardiovascular events and ANCHOR did not lead to FDA approval for that particular range of triglycerides of 200 to 500. Fortunately, we were already doing a cardiovascular outcome trial called Reduce It. This consisted of over 8,000 patients, 70% of whom were secondary prevention, 30% of whom were high-risk primary prevention, i.e. diabetes plus at least one additional cardiovascular risk factor, Triglycerides had to be between 135 and 500, and LDL had to be between 40 and 100. Everybody by protocol had to be on a stable dose of statin therapy, tolerating it, taking it, adherent to it, et cetera. They were then randomized to four grams a day of icosapentethyl, more specifically two grams uh, twice a day uh, for a total dose of four grams a day versus placebo. And uh, the reason we use four grams a day here in jealous, you may recall it was 1.8 grams a day is four grams a day gets Western patients to the same level of EPA as 1.8 grams does to the average Japanese patient because Japanese patients tend to eat much more fish, uh, at least historically. So that's why the dosing is a little bit different. 
uh, in Japan and in the West. But uh, four grams a day of icosapentethyl versus placebo followed for up to 6.2 years and an average of 4.9 years, or I'll say an average of five years. The primary endpoint is shown here, five-point MACE, or major adverse cardiovascular events. Time from randomization to the first occurrence of a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, coronary revascularization, or unstable angina requiring hospitalization. So that's the primary endpoint, an expansive cardiovascular endpoint. And before getting to that, just to let you know, the background medical therapy in this trial was excellent. As you can see, the vast majority of patients were on high proportions of evidence-based generic therapies. That is high use of antiplatelet therapy, dual antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulants, mostly in AFib, ACE or ARB, beta blockers, and by protocol, everyone's supposed to be on a statin. So really uh, excellent background medical therapy. So what I'm going to describe is incremental uh, to that. And this is what we found. That primary endpoint I just mentioned, a 25% relative, 5% absolute risk reduction, highly statistically significant, a number needed to treat of only 21. And if for some reason you don't like the endpoints of revascularization or unstable angina, and just wanna look at hard endpoints, cardiovascular death MI stroke also significantly reduced similar large relative and absolute risk reductions. Absolute risk reductions going from event rates of 20% to 16%. So a large absolute as well as relative risk reduction. And this is again on top of great background medical therapy in a blinded placebo controlled trial with independent adjudication of endpoints. The results were consistent across multiple pre-specified subgroups for the primary endpoint and also for the key secondary endpoint. And in a pre-specified hierarchical testing sequence, uh, everything in the green box was statistically significantly reduced, including significant reductions in death from cardiovascular causes, significant reductions in fatal or non-fatal MI, and even significant reductions in fatal or non-fatal stroke with a trend towards a lower rate of all-cause mortality. That is time to first event. That's the usual conservative way of analyzing data. Shown here are total events not just the first event, but a recurrent event. Say somebody that has a non-fatal MI, but then goes on to have a stroke or maybe even dies from cardiovascular causes. That's the recurrent event. And what we see here is a significant reduction, not only in first events, as I just showed you, but also significant reductions in second, third, and fourth or more events. A large relative risk reduction here uh, using one particular methodology, a 31% reduction and in absolute terms, 500 fewer events. Events in absolute terms reduced from 1,700 to 1,100, so 500 fewer events, a large absolute risk reduction. And you know, this was the methodology that Stuart Pocock, if you know who he is, he's probably the world's expert in recurrent events analysis, made us do. But our pre-specified methodology to the FDA was actually the Anderson-Gill methodology, and there was a 32% relative risk reduction with a p-value of 10, to the minus 22. So a highly statistically significant, very robust analysis. Uh, you could do all sorts of subgroup and sensitivity analyses and the results hold. Here are the same data shown graphically. The dark lines are total events. The light lines are time to first event. Red is placebo, blue is icosapentethyl. And regardless of whether we're talking about first or total events, same story, large reductions, greater reductions with greater durations of follow-up. I'll also point out though, that even in the treated arm, there's a pretty high rate of residual risk and uh, continuing events that are occurring. And this shows that even in the stable outpatients we enrolled in this trial, by virtue of having even just slightly elevated or even high normal triglycerides, despite dietary counseling, despite being prescribed a statin, despite being adherent to a statin with a documented LDL uh, between 40 and 100, these patients are still at very high cardiovascular risk. So it's deceptive to say, oh, they're stable outpatients. And if for every thousand patients treated for five years, 159 events prevented. What about side effects? Well, uh, overall, uh, the drug was tolerated as well as, and as safe as the placebo. Uh, if you look at adverse event rates uh, by very sensitive or specific measures, 
uh, looking at the different roles, you'll see virtually identical rates of adverse events. So very well tolerated, very safe overall. We did find when we looked deeply a significant increase in bleeding with icosapentethyl versus placebo going from about 10% to 12%. And uh, that was fortunately mostly minor bleeding. If we look at major bleeding, no significant increases in GI bleeding, in GU bleeding, in central nervous system bleeding, in intracranial bleeding, in fatal bleeding. Uh, and this was also true that there was no significant difference in those bad forms of bleeding in patients on single or dual antiplatelet therapy or in patients on anticoagulants. Uh, having said that, if a patient you know, is having active problems with bleeding, that wouldn't be the time to introduce this drug. The other thing we found when we looked was a statistically significant increase in hospitalization for atrial fibrillation with icosapentethyl versus placebo, though fortunately for bad AFib, the rates were similar, 0.5% in each arm in this blinded trial. And the majority of excess AFib occurred in patients with a history of atrial fibrillation uh, that was already known. Um, having said that, there's no black box warning or contraindication to using icosapentethyl in patients with atrial fibrillation, but if you are, you'd wanna make sure that that atrial fibrillation is well controlled as it should be anyway. That is that they're rate controlled, if appropriate, rhythm controlled, and if appropriate, which it usually is, that they're on an anticoagulant. But you'll recall that in the overall trial, there was no increase in stroke. In fact, there was a 28% significant reduction in stroke with icosapentethyl versus placebo with consistent findings in the subgroup of patients with a history of atrial fibrillation or who developed atrial fibrillation in the trial. Now, let me uh, quickly go through some other uh, secondary analyses from Reducit. This is examining patients by baseline triglyceride tertile showing consistent, in fact, significant benefit favoring icosapentethyl versus placebo, even in patients in the lower range of triglycerides. In fact, in the 10% of patients with normal triglycerides between 100 and 150, uh, there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death MI stroke, even in that uh, relatively small subgroup. How do we put this in the context of other triglyceride lowering trials? Well, lots of different drugs, lower triglycerides, uh, but relatively few translate into reduction in cardiovascular events. Sure, you can go back in time to VA hit with gemfibrozole. There was a significant reduction in MACE there uh, with fiber, but that largely predated the statin era. Yes, you can quote uh, GISI uh, Prevencione, that omega-3 fatty acid preparation there. There was a modest reduction in cardiovascular events, but again, largely predating the statin era. But with statins, there's really just jealous and reduce it where uh, icosapentethyl specifically uh, was the drug that reduced major adverse cardiovascular events. And jealous, you know, the statin use there was uh, relatively low, medium intensity, uh, not the best LDL control at baseline in that trial. It was open label, it was only Japanese patients, uh, but reduce it uh, with an international patient population, largely Western, uh, and with good background therapy, including good LDL control, uh, has shown a robust reduction in events. Let me move on now to some mechanistic data, reduce it to EPA. Uh, this examined levels of achieved on-treatment icosapentenoic acid, finding statistically significant correlations with higher levels of EPA and lower rates of the primary endpoint, the key secondary endpoint, cardiovascular death, and even total mortality, as well as strong and significant correlations with higher EPA and lower rates of MI, stroke, coronary revascularization, and unstable angina. These relationships held up in both the secondary and primary prevention cohorts, and also held up for the tertiary endpoints of sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest, and even for heart failure. Now in the overall trial, heart failure wasn't significantly reduced, but here we see at the highest attained levels of EPA, a significant reduction in heart failure. So, you know, all this, um, we're doing a lot more fancy analysis, mediation analyses, and so forth, but it does appear that the predominant driver of benefit here is the attained on treatment EPA. How does this then fit in with trials uh, like uh, strength? Well, in the strength trial, which was a mixture of EPA and DHA and other stuff at four grams a day, the baseline level of EPA was similar to and reduce it in the Western population studied. 
But look at strength. Um, the level of EPA attained at the uh, year one, end of year one, a steady state level, approximates what was seen at baseline in the jealous trial in Japanese patients with higher fish intake. So strength basically got to where jealous started off with. Now look at where jealous ended up at 170 in terms of the uh, uh, plasma level. And here, reduce it, it's the serum level, but it's close enough, uh, basically at 170 as well. So if there is a threshold effect at which you need to get to a certain, above a certain level of EPA, it wouldn't have happened in strength, uh, but it did happen in jealous and reduce it. Now in jealous, it was with 1.8 grams a day of icosapentethyl. With reduce it, it was oh, with four grams a day, but that's because we purposely dose, chose the dose and reduce it to get to where these Japanese patients got with 1.8 grams a day. Now let me move on to reduce it diabetes. This was a pre-specified subgroup of 4,700 patients with diabetes, either a, a primary or secondary prevention diabetes. And same color scheme, red is placebo, blue is icosapentethyl, uh, dark lines are total events, light lines are uh, time to first event a primary composite endpoint, key secondary composite endpoint, but the story is the same for all these endpoints. A significant reduction, large relative risk reductions, large absolute risk reductions, and underscoring just how high the event rate is, even in the icosapentethyl arm, illustrating the double whammy of having both diabetes and elevated triglycerides despite all attempts at dietary counseling and statin and other lifestyle modification efforts that our investigators were employing. So really is um, a risk uh, prognosticator to have elevated triglycerides and especially if diabetes is also present. Let me move on now to reduce it revasc. Um, this examined the end point of coronary revascularization, finding a significant benefit with icosapentethyl versus placebo. This benefit kicked in very early, soon after randomization, and was consistently statistically significant by 11 months. So an early effect on clinical endpoints, paralleling what was seen on IVUS and CHERRY and CT angio in evaporate on the interim analysis. And also significant reductions in elective, urgent, and even emergent coronary revascularization. And I think quite interesting, significant reductions in this blinded trial with independent adjudication of endpoints in PCI and also in the need for cabbage. That as well is significantly reduced. And we really haven't seen this sort of effect on revascularization since the 4S trial, which as you may recall was a trial of statin versus placebo. Reduce it is a trial of icosapentethyl versus placebo but on top of statin. So really an incremental advance here. Let me share now with you reduce it PCI. This is a subgroup of patients with a history of percutaneous coronary intervention. And here you can see large absolute and relative risk reductions in MACE in these 3000 patients, also in the key secondary endpoint, a significant reduction. And then reduce it cabbage, a subgroup of patients with a history of prior coronary bypass grafting. And once more, a significant reduction in the primary endpoint and in the key secondary endpoint in these 1800 patients. So uh, a reduction in the endpoint of revascularization and in patients with a history of revascularization and endpoint, uh, a, re a reduction in the endpoint of MACE. Now let me share with you uh, very rapidly just some other information about uh, Reduce It and its perception. Uh, this is the ICER group based in Boston it's a not-for-profit group that does cost-effectiveness analyses. They're uh, very, very conservative. I don't mean uh, politically conservative. I mean, they're very um, uh, cautious uh, in their assumptions. Uh, they're uh, very extreme, I would say. But despite that approach, uh, they found that in 100% of their simulations using trial-level data, that icosapentethyl was cost-effective. And in our patient-level cost-effectiveness analysis led by Bill Weintraub, he found icosapentethyl uh, to be not just cost effective, but in the majority of scenario analyses, a dominant strategy. And what that means, that's cost effectiveness parlance, that it's not just cost effective, it's actually cost saving on a health systems level, a societal level. Obviously for a patient, they don't care about this, they just care about the prescription drug costs. But, uh, but on a societal level, it actually would save money because it prevents lots of costly events.
What have the guidelines said about reducing an icosa pentethyl? Well, for the sake of time, I can't go through them other than to just show that the American diabetes has given icosa pentethyl a level A recommendation, their highest level, largely mirroring the reduce it like uh, population. The ESC and EAS in Europe have given it a 2A recommendation, the National Lipid Association, a class one recommendation, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have endorsed its use in reduce it like patients. Uh, in this AHA scientific statement, uh, the use of icosapentethyl is recommended in reduce it like patients. And by the way, I recuse myself from this portion of this scientific statement. Uh, the medical letter has endorsed the use of icosapentethyl in a patient population, uh, essentially mirroring the reduce it uh, trial. And even the House of Representatives has mentioned reduce it and the potential therapeutic value of EPA uh, in their uh, deliberations in the Committee on Appropriations. Uh, finally, the U.S. FDA uh, head or the uh, advisory board to the FDA had voted unanimously to approve a label expansion for icosapentethyl. They mentioned they voted unanimously and the drug had been previously approved for high triglycerides to hopefully prevent pancreatitis. Uh, but now in blue is the label update uh, saying uh, essentially in reduce it like patients uh, that the drug is indicated, specifically those with established cardiovascular disease or diabetes plus two additional cardiovascular risk factors and triglycerides greater than or equal to 150, either fasting or non-fasting triglycerides. So pretty broad uh, label expansion. And it's been a long uh, road to approval. Uh, lots of different studies, a lot of data that I couldn't review for the sake of time, but the US FDA and even Health Canada have approved icosapentethyl based on the REDUCE it trial. And, um, uh, to point out that uh, if you don't realize, both those uh, regulatory agencies take the raw data from the trial and analyze it independently. So two independent groups vetting uh, the findings that we published uh, from Reduce It. And in fact, the uh, data are under review by the European Medicines Agency and the Chinese Regulatory Authority as well. So hopefully um, in the months to come, there'll be approvals in various regions of the world outside of North America. So how does this then fit into the larger context of residual risk reduction? Well, the PROVE-IT trial by uh, you know, my colleagues here in Boston, uh, Chris Cannon, uh, Dr. Braunwald showed that more intense statin therapy versus less intense statin therapy provided incremental cardiovascular risk reduction. Building upon that, non-statin mediated LDL reduction uh, through azetamib and PROVE-IT further reduced cardiovascular risk. And now with reduce it, we have yet another way of reducing cardiovascular risk beyond the LDL lowering axis with relative and absolute risk reductions that in fact exceed what was seen in the practice changing prove it and improve it trials. So finally, I'll say we've got to redefine how we think about residual risk. In patients with known cardiovascular disease or at high risk of it, I personally think we should endorse a plant-based diet, regular daily physical activity, weight control, and for the majority of those types of patients, to the extent they can tolerate it, high intensity statin therapy. Then beyond that, it's a matter of targeting their residual risk, whether it's cholesterol mediated, inflammatory mediated, thrombosis mediated, triglyceride mediated, LP little a mediated. And I don't have enough time to go through all the trials that exist or are ongoing uh, to validate these approaches, other than to say it's an enormous body of work that's completed and ongoing. But it does appear from Reduce It, we've got an agent that works through multiple different pathways to address residual cardiovascular risk. And we learned from strength that triglyceride reduction per se alone isn't enough to reduce cardiovascular risk. So probably with icosapentethyl and EPA, it's a bunch of other stuff that's going on. Very interesting uh, that uh, will really need to be teased out by scientists in the future. And I do believe that profound reductions in first and total cardiovascular events with icosapentethyl and the reduced trial really should usher in a new era in dyslipidemia therapeutics with icosapentethyl, but potentially in the future, uh, other sorts of advanced generation omega-3 fatty acids. And to conclude, you know, I've focused on one particular pathway towards cardiovascular risk reduction, but of course there are many different things uh, that is physicians and public health advocates we've got to focus upon to try to reduce the cardiovascular burden in our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Once again, thank you for the honor of being the Meyerberg Lecturer. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Dr. Bott, thank you so much for very enlightening and inspiring Grand Rounds. I think your journey of uh, starting with uh, starting with the drug, getting it through drug approval, hearing um, all the great clinical science that went behind it in basic science really is a lesson for all of us, I think, uh, to, to appreciate the journey that you've been on uh, to, to get this drug approved. And I certainly would take a snapshot of the uh, CDC advisory, I mean, the FDA advisory committee's uh, vote. That, that's great. So uh, congratulations on that. Um, Dr. Goldberger, do you have a question I understand? Yes, sure. uh, Dr. Bud, just a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, as, a li as a lipidologist, of course, uh, omega-3 uh, and triglyceride lowering is where the story begins. And, uh, but the, the fact that you could show benefit in the lowest triglyceride category in reduce it. And in addition, uh, as I understand it, there was no correlation between the benefit and the amount of triglyceride lowering and reduce it. I is it time to be thinking, uh, following on the way you ended the presentation, that the effect of uh, acosaped ethyl is, is not really driven by triglyceride elevation, but by effects, multiple multifactorial effects, pleiotropic effects on the plaque and that its potential usage as an adjunct to statin therapy may be a lot broader than the hypertriglyceridemic population. Well, I think that's really a fantastic question and perhaps uh, for the field, the most important one in terms of the next uh, set of trials that should be done. Um, we could go back to the JELUS trial where half the patients at baseline at least had normal triglycerides and even more than half once they were started on statin. So, it um, clearly there wasn't a triglyceride lowering story there. There was, I think, about a 5% reduction in triglycerides. And in reduce it, we really don't see any significant impact of the triglyceride lowering. You know, we have started mediation analyses and so forth. And at least what we've uh, publicly presented to date, the changes in triglycerides and other biomarkers other than EPA account for just a trivial uh, proportion of the benefit, really the lion's share of benefit was at the attained EPA level. Uh, so there's no reason to think that that wouldn't apply to patients with quote unquote normal triglycerides. So, you know, in Jealous, half the patients had normal triglycerides and reduce it about 10% had baseline triglycerides between 100 and 150. Now, some people might say even 100 is too high. Maybe, you know, uh, triglycerides will be redefined much like LDL where normal keeps dropping. But in that 10% of patients and reduce it with triglycerides between 100 and 150 at baseline, really the benefits with respect to hard MACE, CV death MI stroke, were essentially the same as in patients with trigs above that. Now, having said that, triglycerides are a powerful driver of risk. That is, if we look at the placebo arm or the drug arm, patients with higher levels of triglyceride elevation in the trial surely had higher event rates. Uh, but in terms of the benefit of the drug, I don't think it's contingent on the triglycerides being elevated, but I think it's easier to demonstrate the benefit of the drug in a trial population like reduce it because the event rate's so high. I think to demonstrate the benefit, say, with triglycerides less than 100 would require a very large trial with, you know, probably a median duration of follow-up of at least five, seven years. Those trials are expensive to fund. Uh, usually the government uh, isn't happy to fund those sorts of trials. Usually industry doesn't want to go that long because they're worried about patent expiration and so forth. So I'm not sure if those trials will be done, but I would say putting the issue of cost aside uh, on the basis of the science and the trials, very likely icosapentethyl would work in that patient who has elevated cardiovascular risk, but doesn't have elevated triglycerides. Thank, thank you. Dr. Goldberger. Hi, uh that that was really a wonderful uh, presentation and wonderful uh, work. Thank uh, you. So I, I'm curious, you know, the pleiotropic effects that you described for I could, I could ethyl, um seem like they would also be uh, beneficial for patients with atrial fibrillation. If you show the, uh, show the increased incidence of atrial fibrillation, do you have any thoughts or, or why you might actually see an increase in atrial fibrillation? You know, it's a great question. I think it's real. It had been described previously in the literature with some prescription omega-3 fatty acids. It was in a package insert for one, not for icosapentethyl, but for another one. 
And it was actually seen in the strength trial. And it was also sort of seen in Amami. There was a trend in Amami, but I think with more events, it would have been significant there too. So that's a real finding. And I think it has to likely do with effects on cell membranes. You know, I showed the work of, uh, of Preston Mason and EPA and DHA and effects on cell membranes. Uh, you know, that might be a good thing for ventricular myocardium. We did see a significant reduction in the blinded pre-specified tertiary endpoints and reduce it of sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest. But we didn't have, you know, Holter monitors per se to look at uh, whether that was actually ventricular, malignant ventricular arrhythmias, but maybe a stabilizing effect on ventricular myocardium, but maybe an effect on atrial myocardium that's a bit disruptive, um, increasing the predisposition to atrial fibrillation. I think this is something that could actually be relatively easily uh, sorted out. I've, I've recommended this to many uh, basic um, electrophysiologists around the world to, to just do that uh, experiment to see if that's true or not. Uh, and I imagine someone somewhere is doing it and what I said will either be proved or disproved, but but I think it could have to do with those sort of differing effects. You know, the chair of our data safety monitoring board is Brian Olshansky. So, you know, I purposely picked a, an electrophysiologist uh, because I was hoping that there'd be a reduction in ventricular arrhythmias. And I was unsure if there would be an increase or a decrease or neutrality with respect to atrial arrhythmias. So I thought, you know, it'd be good to have an electrophysiologist at the helm. And um, it's interesting at the end of the trial, I said, so, you know, uh, Dr. Olshansky, what do you think? Uh, there's this increase in atrial fibrillation. He said the data safety monitoring board didn't really even notice because it was a 1% absolute excess over an average of five years. So in any given year, they didn't really even see that. And, and on seeing it, he said, look, there's no increase in stroke. There's no increase in sudden cardiac death. Those endpoints are actually reduced. Um, and you know, other than just good AFib management, which should be done anyway in AFib patients, uh, nothing there that's a contraindication. But I think there are probably some scientific insights if we could understand the biology of what's driving that. So thank you once again, Dr. Bott. I also want to thank the uh, friends and students of Dr. Meyerberg for sponsoring today's Grand Rounds. And we hope, Dr. Bott, that we get an opportunity to welcome you in person in Miami in the very near future. Everyone have a safe and wonderful day, and thanks for participating. Well, thank you all so much once again for this very, very kind uh, invitation. And again, to be the Meyerberg Lecturer is such an honor. I uh, thank you to all and everyone, please stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, bye now.